Good afternoon. Joining us on the line now is Suzanne Buchanan, who's the former owner and editor of the Samui Times, a news publication on Ko Samui. She covered the stories of the so-called backpacker murders, which occurred in 2014 on Ko Tao, a small island in the Gulf of Thailand, together with other suspicious deaths happening at the time. Although she's a British citizen, because of her investigation and stories, as well as her support for the two Burmese migrant workers sentenced to death, for the murders, she had to flee Thailand for her own safety. There's currently an active warrant for her arrest should she return to Thailand, which had been her home for more than 20 years, and she continues to receive death threats. Her book, The Curse of the Turtle, seeks to uncover the truth behind these violent murders. There's also a Sky documentary series due to air soon called Death on the Beach. Welcome to the show, Susanna. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on the show. Oh, not at all. It's great to have you with us. What what an incredible story. I mean, I, I bet you kind of look back and, and think, how on earth did all this happen to me? I absolutely look back and think, how on earth did all this happen to me? I mean, I went to Thailand to be a scuba dive instructor, not to be a journalist or get embroiled in uh, one of the biggest publicized murder investigations in the in Southeast Asia. So it's, yeah, it's been pretty incredible. Gosh. So how did you go from being a, a diving instructor, which I know you did for a while there, to uh, starting this paper and getting into journalism in general? I kind of fell into it, really. I mean, I've been diving for many years and um, I was getting a little bit burnt out of the same dive sites and answering the same questions every day about how long I've been there and what I missed about home, etc. And I was just uh, looking for something else to do. And a friend of mine had a, a little magazine and he asked if I would like to help him with some restaurant reviews, which meant free food. And I was like, OK, well, I'm, you know, I didn't know if I was much of a writer, but I'd have a go. Um, and I did rather well at it. And then um, a couple of local um, bi-monthly newspapers uh, asked if I'd write for them. And I just, you know, started writing more and more. And eventually in 2013, I started my own, own online news publication, The Samui Times, and it really, really took off. So um, it was 2013 when you started uh, the, the Samui Times, as you said, and then it was uh, the following year, September 2014, when the British backpackers Hannah Witheridge and David Miller were found brutally murdered on Syrie Beach. So tell us uh, about that time. Yeah, I mean, I've been going, I think I started in about April and then uh, the following September, I got a phone call to say there'd been um, two people found dead on the beach. I mean, I had no idea then that, you know, that day would also change my life forever. Um, And we found out they were British and I started investigating. And because really I was the only um, daily paper on the island, although it was online, I was you know, making um, daily articles, every news group in the world were, you know, hungering for information and they were coming to me and I was like, wow, I'm talking to real journalists from real newspapers and not just someone that started up something on Koh Samui. Although, you know, the Samui Times was uh, being read in 140 countries and we were attracting 100,000 visitors a month, but I had no, you know, no clue that it was going to change my life forever as, you know, people like the New York Times and the BBC and Fox News are coming after me for information. So it was quite overwhelming, really. Gosh, I can imagine. Did you did you feel a bit sort of out of your depth with it all, I guess? I didn't as much as, you know, that my, one of my biggest problems was that we all suspected, um, you know, what was going to happen. Um, and being that I was still on the island um, and I was now, you know, in front of the world's press um, and people were asking for interviews, I had to be so careful what I said, because even though I, you know, I thought I knew what was going on, um, I had to be very careful not to put my name to anything. So all these journalists were phoning, asking for statements that I couldn't really give because it's quite precarious when you're on an island. So. Yeah. So what was the situation in terms of we all, you said we all knew what go, what was going on. Did you all have your suspicions as to who it, who it was and, and who it wasn't? Well, it wasn't really suspicions. I mean, event, I mean, originally when the, when the police came down from Bangkok to investigate, um, they were looking at a, a very powerful local family. Um, and one of them had fled to Bangkok and the other one, I'm not sure if he was actually arrested, but he was certainly taken in for questioning. Um, and the policeman on the case at the time made a press statement to say that, you know, this guy was implicated in the murders. Um, there was CCTV footage. You know, there was no way he wasn't involved. And he was a really powerful local person. And we were all thinking, crikey, you know, he must be a really brave policeman if he wants to start implicating this family 
um, in the murders of Hannah and David. But very quickly, he was taken off the case and replaced. Um, and the local family, um, you know, would were just dismissed as having anything to do with it. And we all started to say, you know, who, who's going to be picked on next? And they very much started focusing on uh, Burmese migrant workers. And there'd been a lot of gossip that, you know, the two of them or three of them will be used as scapegoats. And of course, within a couple of weeks, they'd arrested two Burmese. So, um, you know, it, it had been gossiped about a lot before it happened. And you were absolutely convinced at the time and still are that these Burm- Burm- Burmese men were innocent. The first thing I did was go and see them. They were taken down to the prison on my island at Koh Samiri. I mean, and they're just so ridiculously small. I mean, they're absolutely tiny. Um, You know, the the Koh Tower is run by very powerful local families. And I I really can't imagine anybody committing a crime of that magnitude on that beach and then simply sticking around on the island, especially if you're from Burma, when you could very easily go. Um, The authorities said they'd stopped uh, all the boats coming in out of Koh Tower, but that was complete rubbish. I was watching the ferries come in all day. So, you know, they really could have left the next day if they'd done that. Um, They've got no prior criminal convictions. I don't see any motive. You know, the size of them makes it completely implausible. Um, And their DNA wasn't on the murder weapon. So, you know, from day one, I I thought it was highly suspicious. Wow. And uh, what happened to these men? Um, well, they, uh, they were tried and convicted and given the death penalty. Um, the judge said that, I mean, there were no witnesses, there was no CCTV, um, and they said that there was DNA evidence, um, and it was a mixed sample taken from Hannah, um, and that would have contained the DNA of Hannah and Zolin and Wei Pure, the two Burmese boys, so that's three, um, and that's a mixed sample, and the judge said that it was 100% matched to the defendants, um, and therefore, purely on the DNA, he convicted them, but I mean, I've since studied DNA, and um, the DNA expert Jane Torpin from Australia also made press statements to say, you know, there is no such thing as 100% DNA match in a mixed sample of DNA, it's just scientifically impossible. Gosh, how awful. So you, while they were in prison, prison before they were sentenced to death, you, you were going to visit them uh, very regularly, yes, yeah. weren't you? Regularly, I was going down three times a week and um, human rights um, activist Andy Hall managed to find the boys' um, mothers in, in the village and one of their fathers, but he, he died before it came to trial. So um, I spent a lot of time raising funds because in Thai prisons, you know, you can't live on, on what you're given. You have to have money from the outside for toiletries, for fresh water, for enough food to live on, for fruit and things like that. So I raised the money. I used to go and see them three times a week. I paid for their mothers um, to have a, a house, um, not me personally, but on, on funds that I'd raised to have a house. And I took them to the prison three times a week to see their sons. I mean, it was absolutely heartbreaking. Oh, it must have been. It must have been. And and obviously, when it when it happened, in when they were sentenced to death in in uh, twenty fifteen on Christmas Eve. I mean, what what was happening around that time? Were you were you there with the mothers? Yeah, I was there. I mean, I, I'd always been allowed into the court. The, 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 some journalists um, were at the courthouse, but throughout the trial, they were not allowed into the court hearing. I was. But uh, interestingly, on the on the day of the verdict, they suddenly decided I couldn't go into the um, courtroom and all the journalists were allowed in. And I was sort of sitting outside, you know, waiting. And I suddenly had this most awful feeling come over me. I was, I was eating uh, some Thai curry at the time and I felt it come up in the back of my throat. And I said to my partner at the time, oh, good gracious, they, they've been found guilty and sentenced to death and he said what what makes you think that and I ran up the court steps and saw the translator for the Witheridge family coming down the steps and I said it's over isn't it she said yeah they've both got the death penalty oh. um the next thing I heard was the Burmese mothers just screaming the courthouse down um, and I ran in and the Wei Pure's mother just literally came over to me and collapsed in my arms and for all the other people around her people who could speak her language it was my arm she wanted and it was the most humbling moment of my life because we didn't even share a common language Oh, that's absolutely heartbreaking. And have you, I mean, the fact that you don't share a a common language must be very difficult, but have you seen or, or been in touch with the mothers since? No, and unfortunately, neither of the boys, because there's so much trouble at the moment um, in Myanmar or Burma. Um, I got a letter from Zolin two weeks ago to say he had really bad news, and that bad news was he'd not been able to be in contact with his family. I think it's about nine months now, so he's really, really concerned. And obviously, 
throughout COVID, he's not been able to have any visits from the embassy um, or from any of the government officials. And obviously now Burma's under military rule. But we've just had great news that actually the uh, Burmese military have said they will support the boys and they will. I think they're going to do video, video visits with them. So hopefully they can track down the families because they've had no contact with the outside world for nearly two years, apart from letters from me and, and, and uh, other, other supporters. Oh, my goodness. So when when is the, the death uh, sentence due to take place then? Well, we were the, the king um, actually uh, commuted their death sentences to life to life in prison, and that was in. Uh August 2020. I mean, quite often the king on his birthday will, um, you know, give an amnesty. So they're not actually going to be executed now, but they're still looking at life in prison. And even if they get, you know, more and more amnesties, the, 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 the earliest I can see them being released is another 12 years. So that would be 20 years in prison. Goodness me. And um, Thai, Thai prisons are notorious for not being that great, aren't they? They're really not great. I mean, the, the prison on Samui wasn't too bad, really. Um, I mean, I used to visit there three times a week, but where they are now, which is called um, Bangkwang Central Prison, which is also known as the infamous Bangkok Hilton, is absolutely horrendous. And the Thais call it the Big Tiger because it has an ability to eat men alive. And um, Zorlin wrote to me about in a letter about a month ago. He said that, you know, more and more inmates have been committing suicide because no support from the outside, no visits, and they just can't cope with the regime and the brutality. Oh, it's absolutely horrendous. And uh, since uh, this happened in, in the last, uh, well, not the last couple of years with COVID, but before then, like in 2018, 2019, you were contacted by uh, various people who had had uh, similar experience. You were contacted in, in 2018 by a woman whose daughter had been raped on Koh Tao. There had been various other things that had happened around the, the same kind of time or in the same few years. Mm-hmm. I mean, after the murder of Hannah and David, I started looking into the uh, the death of Ben Harrington. Um, he died in, in suspicious circumstances on the island in 2012. And I also started that he's British. And I looked into the death of Nick Pearson, which is another highly suspicious death. Um, that was New Year's Day 2014. So um, I got in touch with, uh, with, with the families of both of those victims. And then, you know, through them, we've contacted other people. So we now have a group, a cohesive group of people who just support each other and look after each other. And, you know, getting these families together and sharing their stories and experiences, lack of uh, support from the embassies. But I got contacted um, in 2018 by a lady in London who said her daughter had been raped on the island. Um, And I went up to London to see her. And uh, the the, the girl had come straight back to the UK, but her travel companion had had, um, kept a T-shirt of hers that had DNA on it. Anyway, um, I, I spoke with her. I checked the evidence. I diligently investigated the story. Um, and then she decided to let me break it in the in the in the, my my newspaper, the Samui Times. I was living back in the UK by then. I'd been here for two years. Um, the Thais immediately said the rape had never happened. Um, they said she just uh, said she was raped to claim travel insurance. They said she couldn't have been raped on the beach because it was high tide that night, which it wasn't. And they also interestingly said it had been the uh, the World Cup. Um, I don't know why that means nobody would get raped. But anyway, um, they tried to extradite her back to face charges of bringing Thailand into disrepute. Um, They said I'd completely made the story up. It was just fake news and promptly issued a a warrant for my arrest. Gosh, so there's so much corruption there, isn't there? And they obviously don't want foreigners trying to go up against them. Well, I know. And the interesting thing was, I mean, while my, my arrest warrant was there, I mean, I still have a house in Thailand that I'll never see again. But they insisted that I'd made that story up and that, you know, it was it was completely fabricated. And yet they flew officers over from Thailand to England to interview the victim. Um, and they pretty much interrogated her for several hours. And eventually when she handed over the T-shirt, they flew back to Thailand and it was case closed. Um, but they also arrested 15 Thai nationals for sharing the story. So um, yeah. they were very, very keen to shut it up. But they're very, they're, you know, they're very happy to shoot the messenger and not sort of address the issues that are going on on the island. Mm. So when and why did you decide to leave the island? What happened? I think pretty much when I was reporting on um, Hannah and David, um, I kept myself very much under the radar. Um, I was putting a lot of stories in uh, in my newspaper, but I wasn't using a byline. So my name wasn't on the on the stories, which I was criticized for quite heavily by other news groups. But I wanted to stay safe. But um, when the boys were convicted 
um, and sentenced to death, I'd rushed up the steps to see the mothers and then the press pack outside had seen me coming down the steps with them, looking after them. So my involvement was then, you know, out there in the open. And I remember on Christmas Day, I rang my dad, who was in the UK, and he said, oh, it was great to see you this morning. And I thought, hang on a minute. He hasn't seen me this morning. And he said, I said, are you okay? You've not seen me, dad, thinking maybe he's got dementia and no one's told me. I saw you on the BBC News and I thought, oh, that's not good. Anyway, the following day after the boys were sentenced to death, there were massive protests on the Burmese Thai border and there were all these trucks driving up and down and my picture holding the mothers was all over it. And I just thought, this is yeah, this is quite dodgy now. So, um, and I was getting a lot of information from friends on the island that, you know, locals were, really weren't happy with me. And, and by 2016 in the April, I just lost my nerve and, and basically ran for it after getting news that there was a, a list and a list of names and my, mine was getting nearer and nearer the top. Gosh, how awful. Frightening, frightening. So do you feel safe in the UK? I mean, you, you say you're still getting death threats, are you? I've had um, I had some uh, a couple of credible death threats from um, from Thailand. One of which you know, I, in, I had to go to the police here, and I ended up getting um, police linked alarms. And you know, my house alarm goes through to the police. I've got panic alarms in the house. I've got a GPS alarm that I carry with me wherever I go. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I, I felt safe the last couple of years because. Um, in tw- after the last really credible death threat, I, I actually got rid of the Samui Times and um, I just shut it down. And then later on, it was sold, although I kept the Facebook page. Um, so it's been pretty quiet. But obviously now with the launch of the book, um, as soon as the book um, hit my publisher's website, the website was attacked by trolls um, and people making all kinds of accusations against me that I burnt someone to death in a bungalow in Koh Tao in 2012. Oh, my goodness. And- 2002 so apparently I burnt someone to death in 2002 but they kept renewing my visa until 2016 so yeah there's just a lot of nasty nasty people out there so I was feeling pretty safe but I think with the launch of the documentary and the launch of the book I should probably go back to my previous state of uh, spending a lot of time looking through my rear view mirror and being very careful where I go oh bless you so uh, this uh, this documentary um, is happening on Sky Crime it's called Death on the Beach there's a, is a three part series isn't it three part series yeah it's going to be available from two o'clock in the morning UK time um, you can download it as a box set uh, and, um, you know, the families of, of quite a few of the victims are, are in there as well. We've worked on it together. We collaborated on the book together and the documentary together. And we spent an awful lot of time filming it. So I'm hoping it's going to be a really balanced and accurate view of, you know, what's actually gone on. Um, things like Pat Harrington. I mean, she um, had an autopsy from Thailand. She's a nurse herself. Had a second autopsy in the UK that bore no resemblance to the one in Thailand. And I know Boyne Annesley, the father of Christina, was really upset that the um, police in Thailand didn't even bother to find the last man t- uh, to see his daughter alive. And he had to track him down himself. Um, mm-hmm. He had nothing to do with it. But I mean, you know, he, he actually, you know, found this guy and the police never even bothered. Wow. So, I mean, what's your, your honest opinion on, on whether you think the situation in, in Thailand with regards to, to crime and, and specific, specifically on foreigners, do you think, do you see it getting any better? I mean, do you see a way out of all this? No, I don't really. I mean, this, you know, obviously, um, I mean, there's just been a disproportionate amount of deaths on Koh Tao. Obviously, you know, the last couple of years, that's pretty much stopped, but that's because no one's been there due to the pandemic. Um, but I know that um, only a few months ago, I think it was last July, that two tourists turn up. They were um, Indian Thai descent. They were very wealthy people. They were reported to be billionaires. They had their own resorts in Phuket. I mean, they were both found dead in the swimming pool on Koh Tao within hours of getting there. Um, and the Thai said, oh, yeah, they had underlying health conditions and they couldn't swim. Well, they'd, they'd gone to one hotel and asked to be moved because that place hadn't got a swimming pool. So, you know, why people who can't swim, who've got underlying health conditions, asked to go to a resort with a swimming pool and both drop dead within 10 minutes of each other? I mean, you know, the, the stories that come out of Koh Tao are just they're not even plausible. Mm. Wow, it's a real worry, isn't it? I mean, th- th- there'll be a lot of people listening uh, who have been to Thailand many times. I myself have been. It's a beautiful country. The people in general are really, really lovely, wonderful people. I mean, you you must have seen that having lived there for, for nearly 20 years. So it's such a shame that there's there's this side of it. I mean, I, I didn't want to leave. I mean, when I first went to Thailand, I was living the dream. It was paradise. And, you know, on the whole, the Thai people are an incredible race of people. And what's mm. really 
me is I've got so much support from my Thai friends who are in Thailand who can't speak out, but they support me because they also want this to be stamped out. They also want this to change. They also want the police's attitude towards, you know, any deaths, but especially foreign deaths to change. And it's, you know, it's almost like having to scold a child that you love. The only way I can save that country is to give it tough love and hurt it first. I mean, I'll never be allowed back. Um, that's a given, but you know, I almost love it enough to do this because, like, you know, there's such amazing people. There. The, the country is so beautiful. The food's incredible. The climate's incredible. The scenery's incredible. You know, there's just one dark, nasty side to it that has no place in, in 2022. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Well, I really hope your your book and uh, your documentary will, will have a big impact. The book is called The Curse of the Turtle. And for people who don't know, there might be people thinking, what's a turtle got to do with it? It's known as Turtle Island, isn't it, Koh Tao? <laughs> Yeah, Koh Tao in English is Turtle Island, so um, that's why it's called. But if, if you read the book, at the, towards the end of it, you'll discover why it's called The Curse of the Turtle. There's a bit of a twist to that one, but no, Koh Tao is a, a Turtle Island in English. Great. Well, the book is available on our website. Um, it's due to be published uh, on the 1st of March. It's coming out, isn't it? It is, yeah. And it's available at the moment on Kindle pre-order. Great. Okay, fantastic. Suzanne Buchanan, thank you so much for joining us and well done for for speaking out and sharing your story. So much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you.